Welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts, producer and host. Since mid-March, the U.S. has been in a state of emergency as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak. States have implemented varying degrees of lockdown procedures, forcing millions of Americans to social distance and stay home in order to keep the virus from spreading. But we can't keep the economy down indefinitely. Millions of individuals have now been furloughed or laid off permanently, and many are struggling to put food on the table. So how do we begin facing these tough questions, and where do we go from here? Stephen Barrows, who's the Director of Programs here at Acton Institute, joins me to answer. As always, if you like this episode, don't forget to leave a like or a comment wherever you're listening and subscribe to the podcast. Act in Line is on Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever podcasts are found. Speaking with me today is Stephen Barrows. He's the Managing Director of Programs here at Acton, and previously he was a professor of economics at Aquinas College, also here in Grand Rapids. Steve, thank you for coming on. My pleasure, Caroline. So you're here to talk with me about the economy and job loss in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. And those are really huge and complex topics we'll be covering here. And, you know, there's a lot to talk about, so let's get into it. The Department of Labor reported that two weeks ago, 4.3 million people filed for unemployment claims, which means that the total number of Americans who have filed for claims since mid-March, the total number is now over 26 million people. It's shocking to see these numbers, and especially when you compare them with the numbers of unemployment claims filed in the past. When you hear that number, that 26 million individuals have filed for unemployment claims, what are your first thoughts? What's your first reaction? Well, there's no doubt that it's completely astonishing. I mean, when the numbers started rolling out and just the speed with which you see individuals that are being laid off and filing unemployment claims, I mean, there's nothing like it. Uh, we haven't seen anything like this before. It just, just illustrates the magnitude of the economic slowdown uh, that has been created because of this pandemic. And so I think just about any economist was shocked, including myself, on just the magnitude and the speed with which this, this occurred. And naturally, you know, these are just not uh, merely statistics, but these are individual lives that are being disrupted and families. And so um, it is something that's uh, quite traumatic and, and will be significant uh, for years to come. Well, you brought up my next point there in that it's important to keep in mind here when we're talking about the numbers of unemployment claims or when we hear about the numbers of businesses that have closed their doors due to lockdowns, is that those aren't just numbers there. Those are individuals with families to support. And for all the people who are now out of work temporarily or otherwise, their being out of work probably doesn't just affect them, but it has ripple effects in both the economy and to individuals around them. Absolutely. You know, when it comes down to it, human beings are, are the most important resource in an economy. It's the, where all the entrepreneurship and innovation, individuals bringing their gifts and talents into the marketplace for exchange. And of course, that's not the only manifestation of work. We see individuals doing work that is not necessarily compensated for in the marketplace. Uh, but when it comes down to it, it's human beings that drive the economy. And so if you see a reduction in individuals um, that are able to engage in ec uh, economic activity, you're going to see correspondingly a slowdown in output of goods and services. And so uh, individual families, like you say, uh, their lives are being disrupted. And we certainly hope this is a sharp downturn followed by a very sharp rebound. And that, of course, remains to be seen. <laughs> now, before we began recording here, you were speaking to me a bit about uh, your findings on this morning in the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Can you touch on that? Sure. So um, when the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, uh, you know, indicates what the latest unemployment uh, numbers are, you know, we did have historically low unemployment prior to this, uh, this pandemic, and it was as low as 3.5%, which is about uh, you know, a half-century record. Um, and so when we see the numbers decline uh, in terms of job, job, uh, jobs that people have, we're going to see a corresponding rise in unemployment. And you've just seen a very small tick up in the, in the March numbers to 4.4%. But most of the numbers uh, that are coming in and the things that the Bureau of Labor Statistics are measuring are going to be occurring after the mid-March time frame when the most dramatic uh, jobless claims have been filed. So I would anticipate that as you see the April numbers appear in early May, 
you could see upwards of the mid-teens in terms of an unemployment rate that just reflects the sharpness of the downturn. Um, so as you see individuals losing these jobs or being pulled out in, in unemployment, and you're going to see a corresponding rise in the unemployment rate. So something that um, I'd like to get your thoughts on is how this job loss affects people both tangibly and intangibly. Because, you know, job loss doesn't only empty our pockets, but it also affects us mentally. Um, Reverend Ben Johnson, who's a senior editor here at Acton, brought attention to this in an article um, recently that he wrote for Acton. Um, This is really sobering information, but it's important. He noted that, quote, nationwide alcohol sales increased by 55 percent during the week ending in March 21. Police in Chicago, Boston, Dallas, and Los Angeles report double-digit spikes in domestic violence. Drug overdose has more than doubled in parts of western New York State. And calls to suicide hotlines have risen dramatically. Steve, what does this—I mean, what—first of all, I guess, just what do you have to say about this first, and what does this say about people and the importance of work? You know, there's, I I think it's, uh, those statistics are also quite um, remarkable. And when you think about work, obviously the most important thing or the most evident thing, I guess, when people lose their job is the loss of income and the disruption that that causes, particularly if individuals find themselves in a situation where they don't have a safety net, they didn't have sufficient savings or what have you. So there's an immediate disruption in how do I provide for the basic needs of myself and my family. But then you highlighted a number of other things, you know, individuals, Um, depending upon their ability to be resilient, are going to then oftentimes turn to other things. And sometimes those things can turn into negative events, such as, you know, abuse in families or uh, self-abuse and so forth. We do find that, uh, especially in situations of long-term unemployment, uh, the mortality rates and comorbidities that you find in individuals who are unable to to be reemployed in a fairly short period of time, they skyrocket. And so certainly there are all of these other negative impacts uh, beyond just the pocketbook. And I think what it really underscores is that, you know, there's something intrinsic to work that gives us dignity. And in fact, you know, I come from a Catholic Christian background, and and Pope John Paul II had written an encyclical about 40 years ago that underscored this, that, that, that work is actually something that distinguishes humanity from all of the rest of creation. It has an end goal to it. It fills us with purpose. And it's not just merely a way of providing for our subsistence like animals would be in the forest, right? I mean, animals are doing something, but it's certainly not work. And so um, work is something that really does provide more than just something to fill our basic material needs. It also provides us a dignity and a purpose. And when individuals lose their jobs, they have to find other ways to recognize um, how they can apply their gifts and talents, at least in the short run, until they can have work in the marketplace again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Believe it or not, people are uh, more than just material beings, right? <laughs> Absolutely, both body and soul. And so, you know, I know that when I, I think all of us who have experienced the satisfaction of having done something very, very difficult, and it, and you see the completion of your work, and you look back on it and you say, wow, okay, that was that was a real challenge, and it was successful, and it makes you feel good. It, you, you you sense your purpose and, and uh, the gifts that you have in that. Now, there have been a number of times throughout this crisis that I've seen instances where people have pointed out, you know, the economic costs of this lockdown. And then I see other people accuse them of not taking the virus seriously enough or not caring enough about individual lives that are being lost as a result of COVID-19. And it makes me think, you know, I believe that every life is absolutely precious. And in many ways, that's why I think it's important to look for market-based solutions to this virus, because economic costs have human costs, too. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that, of course, these are extraordinarily complex questions that people are dealing with. And uh, we're suffering from a lot of uncertainty, obviously, because we have so much to learn yet about the virus, um, how it spreads, uh, how dangerous it is. And, uh, and, of course, ways to mitigate it, either by treating it or creating a vaccine. And so individuals are rightly uh, concerned about the impact on people's health and lives uh, of that virus spreading. At the same time, we obviously see the economic impacts of trying to engage in social distancing and having lockdowns and shelter in place. And eventually, um, from an economist standpoint, um, it is certainly true that um, you know, human beings have infinite worth and dignity. And yet, at the same time, we can put an economic cost, uh, relative trade-offs, to the deaths that occur because individuals end up despairing and engaging in self-harm, right, uh, because they've lost their job. 
uh, versus those who are being killed directly by the virus. So that's the space that we're navigating right now. What are these relative trade-offs and how do we make uh, a reasonable decision that's in the best interest of society? So um, that's, it's a real enormous challenge for all of us. Well, I think a big element here that's part of this conversation is, you know, none of us know what goes on in everyone else's lives and all the factors that are at play every single day, it, you know, whether it involves someone going to work to be able to provide um, for their family in ways that we just don't know about. Yeah, I've seen a few outlets estimate that if we take the virus seriously and possible second or third waves of this virus really seriously, then we all need to be in lockdown for maybe mm-hmm. months more. It seems like a lot of experts have been applying their knowledge to fields that they don't have expertise in. And sure. I, I mean, you know, really beyond that, no one can predict what will happen and we don't we don't know all the factors. So, you know, in many ways, this just reveals that age old problem of the, uh, you know, knowledge deficiency that we have. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, of course, I'm speaking as an economist and have really no sense of epidemiology or virology. And, uh, but I think one of the things that you can think about um, in terms of the knowledge problem is that we do know that there are differences um, in, in, in urban areas versus rural areas. And the way the virus spreads is going to impact communities in different ways. We can see that different things are occurring in the way uh, countries approach this, whether it be Sweden having a li- less rigorous approach to the lockdown versus other countries. So unfortunately, this is sort of a real-time experiment in seeing what things work and what don't. Uh, and so I think this, that uh, you know, decision makers have largely approached this in a risk-averse fashion, um, which is understandable because there's so much that's not known. At the same time, there's then a reflection of sort of the dangers of decisions that are applied sweepingly across the board, uh, regardless of circumstance. So, you know, what's occurring in, say, South Dakota may not be the same thing that's occurring in New York City. And I think those things ought to be accounted for in some way. Yeah, exactly. All right. So going off of that, let's talk about what the federal government has tried to do to step in and help people make ends meet. Um, The CARES Act is the largest relief bill that has ever been passed. And to put it in perspective, Mm -hmm. the CARES Act provides $1.8 trillion to individuals and businesses. And the stimulus package passed after the crash in 2008 provided $831 billion. So, Steve, what does the CARES Act promise to do with this $1.8 trillion? Well, certainly the CARES Act is is a sort of a classic fiscal response to economic trauma uh, that sort of reflects a Keynesian attitude um, towards how to how to try to manage economic fluctuations. And, you know, it's come really in basically four phases. You have the, the very initial act that was passed in early March that provided targeted funding for health agencies and vaccine research. And then when you had a, a sort of a, a segue to a uh, coronavirus response act where you provided support to families. And then you had, as you cited, the CARES Act with a full two, $2 trillion worth of relief. And and, you know, on the one hand, there's a desire to have a humanitarian response for individuals that are losing their jobs and businesses that are being disrupted, um, and, and also simultaneously an effort to provide a surge in focusing on responding and creating a virus and treatments and protection, protection equipment for individuals engaged in, in uh, health care. Um, but underlying all of this, I think, is an assumption that all you need is to have money in people's pockets to sort of keep things moving as they were. But I think the thing that people need to remember is that economies are all about actual productive activity. And so, although I acknowledge that there's a humanitarian um, intent here, in reality, we ultimately need to find ways to help people bring their gifts and talents back into the marketplace, into exchange, because whether it be fiat paychecks or whether it be fiat uh, printing of money by the central bank, that is not real economic activity or real wealth creation. Um, so, so those are just a few ways to look at this as a whole. And if you'd like, we could drill down into some of the specifics that that act is trying to accomplish. We'll get into that very soon. But first, I want to ask you a question off of that. If the CARES Act does promise to give people the liquid cash that they might need to keep their businesses open, for example, until lockdowns are loosened, wouldn't that prepare them to be able to produce later on? So there is a potential, I suppose, that if you're trying to, to minimize the disruption, 
Um, and that is to say, if you have a bunch of small businesses or otherwise that would uh, let go of their workers and then they simply don't return when things start to rebound, uh, those businesses might not be able to continue their activity and they might have to declare bankruptcy or just they end up ceasing to exist. Um, so the challenge is, is, as you noted earlier, we're not quite sure how long this disruption is going to continue. And so while it might be something relatively brief, let's just say two months, uh, where you could suddenly have individuals come back to the original job that they had and these things just start up once again as they were. Um, the reality is this could continue in different cycles. You could see another lockdown in the fall. You could see another lockdown, you know, even a year from now. And, and it's difficult to justify trying to preserve the sort, sort of the disintegration of these businesses by continually just giving paper paychecks to people until you can come back to normal. So it's a real risk because in the end, you need to have actual productivity uh, return and return quickly. Let's get into the provisions of the CARES Act. Uh, So what is your opinion of what exactly is in the bill? What are the pros and cons in it? Well, on the one hand, uh, there are just direct financial assistance in terms of paychecks to, to taxpayers. So that uh, comes in various dollar amounts depending upon your prior income that you reported on your taxes. And so they're trying to provide immediate uh, fiscal relief to individuals. Now, it's interesting. Uh, certainly, that tells you something about uh, the sweeping nature of the, the assistance. So if you're just basing it on last year's income, there are some people who are going to lose their jobs that won't actually receive any any income at all, or any relief at all, because their incomes were so high the previous year. And on the other hand, you're going to be giving checks to individuals who may still well be fully employed, receiving the paycheck that they had received before the coronavirus. And so in the end, it's just not trying to be targeted at all, which of course has its problems. You're spending money that you wouldn't otherwise spend, and in some cases not provide relief to others who could, could make use of that relief. And then, of course, there are other elements in this bill, whether it be providing an expansion of unemployment benefits, so individuals who do file claims will not only receive the unemployment benefits that the states had provided before, but also $600 more a week. Um, we could talk about that, um, the incentive effects of that when the economy rebounds, But that's one aspect of this bill is direct payments to workers. Um, Just a couple of highlights of of other elements of the bill. There's um, efforts to provide uh, support and and loans to small businesses. There's enormous amounts of relief dollars to major industries, such as the airline industry and and, and other industries that are otherwise finding themselves in a situation of collapse. And that there are a number of healthcare related provisions, whether it be research, or um, subsidizing the hospitals that are having to shut down certain sectors of their work. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's enormous. It's sweeping. We really haven't seen anything like it. You mentioned incentives there and how um, they might be put off balance by the CARES Act. So in what way would the incentives be harmfully manipulated by this bill? So if you end up having, and there have been cases uh, of this that have been cited uh, by business owners, an individual uh, wrote in the Wall Street Journal last week that they own a number of restaurants and I think on the order of 700 employees, they had to lay off those individuals because of the lockdown. And so they quickly shifted to a carryout model and they were surprised to see the demand that materialized when they went to a carryout and delivery model. And so they attempted to hire back a number of workers to respond to that demand, and they found that almost without exception, uh, those workers that they reached out to decided not to return to work. And of course, the question then becomes, why didn't they return to work? And uh, although the motives could vary from individual to individual, from a financial standpoint, the a business owner could no longer compete with the, um, the unemployment payments that were being offered to these workers once they had filed their claims. So they just couldn't afford to bring them back because they couldn't compete with the, with the income they were already receiving. So now I'm sure some of those individual workers might have been a, a little scared about getting back out into the marketplace and whether or not they might contract coronavirus. But either way, there's now suddenly this economic competition between work or not work based on, this, on the compensation you receive on the choice that you make. We'll talk about unintended consequences. And even though we're already seeing some of these play out, I don't think we've come even close to realizing the full impact of all the unintended consequences that could come out as a result of this bill later down the road. Yes, I I think that you were seeing a a short run, almost knee-jerk reaction. Again, it's not surprising. I think that we find ourselves, uh, historically, we've observed how the government 
uh, feels like they have to act in certain ways with massive spending bills. Uh, but there's no such thing as a free lunch, and we know that. We know that in the long term, uh, these obligations are um, are being created without corresponding productive activity to supply those uh, those assistance uh, programs. In the end, you have to have actual economic productivity in order to uh, to move forward. So it is. We, we're not quite sure how that's going to impact future generations when those obligations come due. I was going to say our children and likely our grandchildren will still be paying off these debts, you know, well through their lives. That's right. That's right. Now, of course, there are different economic theories that, you know, individuals, some individuals promote something called, uh, you know, it, the uh, modern monetary theory, where they suggest that there really is no downside, that we can print money at will and spend money at will because we're a sovereign nation that can d- then just, uh, you know, meet our obligations by printing more money. But if you take a look at history, in the end, both history and economic logic inform you that this does not make any sense. We both have repeated historical examples where governments get uh, way ahead of themselves and being unable to meet their fiscal obligations. And so they turn to the central bank to print money and that it creates higher rates of inflation. And in some historical instances, it turns into hyperinflation. Now, I personally don't think inflation for the United States is a concern in the near term. Um, nevertheless, if you continue to, with that kind of philosophy, all it takes is for others throughout the global economy to lose confidence in the U.S. dollar and the U.S. commitment to uh, to paying off its obligations and debt, and you find yourself in a real economic uh, conundrum. I would like to switch gears here and maybe talk about something a bit more hopeful. <laughs> I've noticed, sure, absolutely. you know, I get bombarded with all the news um, about coronavirus, about deaths as a result of coronavirus, or, you know, the economic downturn and the impacts that it is having on individual lives, that I'd like to bring a little bit of hope and encouragement to this particular episode, um, and especially when we're talking about something as large and significant as the economy. Um You know, even in the midst of economic downturn and anxiety over the virus, there's so many good examples out there of people stepping up to help put food on their neighbor's table or creatively help meet needs. Um, I've seen some new breweries or I've seen news about breweries here in Michigan, for example, start producing hand sanitizer. Or there's even a personal example I have. Um, My family just bought masks from a woman in our neighborhood um, who's recycling material into masks and selling them. Um, There's also another great story that I saw last night about how the supermarket chain Publix just bought a lot of the excess milk and produce that farmers so far haven't been able to sell. And they're buying that and then giving it back to food banks. So it meets the needs of both the farmers who need to sell their produce and the people who need food the most right now. You know, what are some ways that we can be creative and help people around us and maybe go around uh, current restrictions that we might be facing to do that? Well, yeah, I think those are some great examples, and I've seen even in my own community things like that happening where I saw somebody in our neighborhood uh, post on Facebook that they were um, you know, basically baking and these wonderful treats, and then they would take that those funds and provide them towards making masks and other kind of charitable activities. And so you can find that individuals are just spontaneously coming together in community, um, you know, of course, retaining the social distancing and making sure that they do things that are in accordance with the public uh, requirements in that regard, but they're still innovative. And so I think it's really neat to see how people instinctively, I think, and it reflects our desire to work and to contribute to society and use our gifts and talents in a way that serves our fellow human beings. And so uh, those stories, and even in my own neighborhood, the one I just described, are great examples of of how individuals can can be um, responsive to the situation. So here in Michigan, Governor Gretchen Whitmer is expected to extend the shelter-in-place laws through May 15, Um, but other states are beginning to ease up on lockdowns already. Maybe some people can see a light at the end of the tunnel, but obviously this economy won't bounce back right away. There's so much left to build back up, and there's so many businesses that have gone out that are never coming back. I won't ask you to predict the future here, but what are maybe some ways that we can economically build back up from here? What are maybe some ways that um, we can perhaps stimulate the economy through our actions um, to help at least get us a little closer to where we were before this hit us? Well, I think a few things, you know, one of the things that this is highlighting is uh, in, in one positive sense, when we go through periods of suffering, 
it affords us the opportunity to look back with gratitude on the things that we had. And so oftentimes you'll hear people that had to, you know, the, that generation that had to go through the Great Depression and World War II, we refer to as the greatest generation oftentimes. And that's because we, I think many of those individuals not only sacrificed their lives and, and went through great suffering, but they also had a deep sense of gratitude uh, for what it was that they had and, and what it means when we're experiencing pos- prosperity, not to take it for granted. And so although this situation has been truly traumatic for many of us, um, it does also then underscore the amazing, um, the, the amazing fact of how much our economies globally has prospered, uh, whether that be in, t- in terms of the benefits that derive from urbanization and globalization, where we find a continued interaction and the division of labor and our use of our gifts and talents. And I think that as we go forward, it will only be amplified all the more. Now, some people suggest that we're going to see a contraction of globalization and suspicion, but we have to remember that globalization, urbanization, the division of labor all amplify both the good, right, as well as sometimes amplify the negative, such as a pandemic, right? Uh, so going forward, I think we need to remember that the things that brought us to this kind of prosperity up to this point can only serve us continually in the future in that regard. Um, one other thing that I think is going to occur is you're going to see a tendency towards what we call dematerialization. More and more individuals are saying, wow, we have the capacity to work, or at least some of us have the capacity to work through you know, video teleconferencing and Zoom and so forth. Um, there is something about that kind of work that requires us to use less intensively physical resources of the earth. And I think we're going to see more and more ingenious ways through entrepreneurial activity to amplify those benefits that are in these ideas that are coming out in the midst of lockdowns. So though it has been a challenge, I think going forward, these are lessons that we're learning and that we're going to continue to see grow and amplify in the future. Steve, thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to chat with you, Caroline, and hope you stay safe and and are well. Thank you so much for listening today. You can read more about a lot of the information in this podcast in our show notes, and those are posted every Wednesday at blog.acton.org. That's blog.acton, A-C-T-O-N dot O-R-G. Also, if you'd like to reach our podcast team here at the Acton Institute and just let us know what you think of the show, you can email us at actonline at acton.org.